Someone told me once that there is something for everyone within anime and manga, no matter what kind of stories or setting you'd like to get immersed in, whether it's sci-fi, romance, drama, fantasy, or horror. The diversity and abundance you have to choose from is infinite. Not to mention that each artist also delivers something unique that can neatly coincide with someone's visual tastes. Despite living in a world that is constantly trying to tell us what's objectively beautiful and what isn't, even what's objectively art and what isn't, our visual tastes are entirely dependent on our likes and dislikes, our experiences, perceptions and so on. But that's a tangent for another video. The reason why I bring this point up is because even though my experience with manga and anime is admittedly on and off nowadays, I do notice that manga art provides something that goes a step further with this notion that it has something for everybody. Not only does it do that, but sometimes it offers something that you were not expecting, or better yet, offers you something that you didn't expect to become absolutely fascinated in. Something utterly bizarre, yet really enthralling. Something that blurs the line between being elegantly beautiful and hideously gruesome. One such manga artist that I feel is the best example is Shintaro Keigo. Although his works are few and far between, his imagery is so instantly recognisable. Perhaps some of these images look familiar to you already. Since I started getting myself stuck down the Keigo rabbit hole recently, I felt compelled to dedicate a video to him today. To do an almost book review video, I guess, on a couple of my personal favourites. Seriously though guys, I know these warnings and disclaimers become just words after a while, but I do have to stress that some of this imagery in today's video is pretty messed up. I'm sure most of you are all for it, but I still feel it's worth a heads up. With that said, welcome to another video everyone. I invite you to witness some of the bizarre manga art of Shintaro Keigo. So considering the fact that some of the artwork we're exploring today may be quite shocking to those not too familiar with his work, I think it's worth taking a brief look at the artist himself as well as his background to help us get a better understanding of his style and creative outlook. Shintaro Keigo was born in 1969 in Tokyo, Japan. He was raised in an artistic family. His father, for example, was an illustrator who specializes in oil painting with chromatic colors. Already drawing since a young age, by the time Shintaro reached 12 years old, he was beginning to wonder what exactly his distinctive style should be. He considered even becoming a film director one day, yet all of his creative ideas would constantly manifest into illustrations. At his school, he would eventually join a manga club, where he would encounter another student in the same grade, whose comics seemed to Shintaro far too, quote, wholesome for their own good. This would prompt something within him, igniting a decision to instead go in the opposite direction, and use his dark sense of humour as a forefront in his illustrations. He was influenced by other manga artists, such as Shigeru Mizuki, Fujiko Fujio, and Katsuhiro Otomo. Though the main driving force behind his developing style was his take on Ero Gulo Nansensu, which according to my sources literally translates into erotic, grotesque nonsense. This style of media art kickstarted in Japan during the 1930s, serving as a sort of nihilistic form of countercultural resistance. Keigo, however, did not refine his talent through art school, firmly believing instead that anyone compelled to draw can develop a niche all on their own. Staying true to his vision, he would soon start picking up attention as his illustrations began to circulate. He would land his first big break with Japanese manga magazine Comic Box at age 19. It would go without saying though, that to showcase such a style of manga within a society known for its conservative social values, that Keigo was taking a huge leap of faith. He would quote on this himself as follows. 30 years ago there were some artists who drew influence from horror manga and caused scandals through their work. There was a period where drawing horror manga became really tough. I'd been told to do myself a favour and stop drawing these kinds of pictures." End quote. Again, perhaps due to long-standing customs of his culture, Keigo never felt comfortable sharing his art with even his own family, despite their interest in art. 
When asked, he would simply reply, it's too provocative, and refuse to comment further. By now though, controversy and backlash to Kago is seen simply as a necessary evil. Whenever he would hear distressed, appalled, disgusted, or angered feedback from readers, Kago would see it more as an accomplishment than negative feedback. Ultimately, the intense gore and absurdity of his illustrations having such an effect on people is basically the whole point. He explains that, quote, When you're free to express whatever you want, it can actually become a hindrance. Whereas when limits are imposed, somehow your expressive range becomes richer. Shock and outrage only proves that he's on the right track. You must draw things that other people don't normally do as much as possible. End quote. As his success in illustrating the concepts, nature, and themes that are normally forbidden or forced into the back of one's mind continue to pick up momentum, the more instantly recognizable his works became within the horror manga scene. At last, for better or for worse, something refreshing had emerged. But just what is his art exactly? In what ways precisely was his imagery pushing boundaries and bending the rules? How has his style become so groundbreaking within not only Japan, but many other countries around the world? Well, here goes nothing. Let's take a look now, shall we? Let's start with a one-shot comic of eight chapters that many might consider to be his more conventional manga, titled Fraction. Fraction at first follows the narrative of a relentless serial killer known as the Slicing Devil in a set of Gower district in Tokyo. He is labelled by the media as the Slicing Devil due to his atrocious way of mutilating his victims, always leaving their bodies sawn in half, later revealed to be all for the purpose of avenging a dead brother. It tells the story more or less from a serial killer's perspective, up right until when he takes his fifth victim. After that, the storytelling style takes a surprising turn. It then begins to basically break the fourth wall entirely by page 31, when it introduces none other than the artist himself, Shintaro Keigo, as a self-insert character referred to as a manga artist, who also happens to be successful in the Eraguru genre. Also, much like Keigo in real life, the manga artist is constantly met with criticism and backlash for his explicit and extreme imagery. Fearing his career and success might become stagnant and for too narrow an audience, the manga artist begins to contemplate broadening his forte and no longer producing mangas filled with excessive gore and perverse sexual themes. So instead, he opens up to his publisher and he wishes to explore mystery stories and experiment with something that reveals a lot about the overall style of Fraction, known as narrative manipulation. I'll get a little bit more into that in just a moment. The focus of a story jumps periodically between the slicing devil and the manga artist. When focused on the killer, the manga explores a mind truly spiraling into insanity. I mean, sure, a serial killer who cuts bodies in half, you could fairly argue is already insane. But specifically, he starts to become more paranoid of an apparent copycat killer he begins to doubt his own memories, and even whether his victims had even died at all. I really wish I could share more details of where this all leads to, but I honestly wouldn't dare spoil it for you. The twist is honestly so insane and unexpected that I leave it to you to find out. What's intriguing is how when the manga switches back to Keigo, or quote-unquote, the manga artist, we get a real in-depth exploration and almost presentation of how narrative manipulation can be used within a manga. For any aspiring writers or comic book artists out there, you may find this interesting. Within certain movies, novels, TV shows, or in this case, mangas, Narrative manipulation is used as a fun way of toying with the reasoning of the reader or the audience. The manga artist presents very in-depth examples of how certain characters or details can be used as a distraction or illusion, even right down to the gutters in between the image panels that can be used effectively to trick the reader into seeing one thing, then something else entirely on the next page. A lot of classic mystery books and films have used this sort of red herring technique, which even the manga artist mentions himself. 
As engaging as the Devil Slicer plot is, the chapters following the manga artist were probably my favourite sections of a manga. It's fascinating how Keigo offers a glimpse into not only his life, but also his knowledge of storytelling and how a manga artist can truly experiment with what would normally be considered limitations. There is of course another crazy plot twist even surrounding the manga artist and what role he plays in the overarching story, but again I'm going to keep my lips sealed and try to keep this as spoiler free as possible. Overall though, this book is a must read in my opinion, and a personal favourite. It's not super surreal imagery wise compared to his other works, but the atmosphere he creates with dramatic, eye catching highlights and shadows is very impressive. And despite the story being overall incredibly dark, and still with plenty of violence and blood splats, there are some quite funny moments and unexpected laughs here and there. Dark humour isn't for everyone, but it hit the sweet spot for me. I say if you want to kind of dip your toes into the world of Shintara Keigo, this manga is a perfect first stop for you. Next up, I think it's worth taking a look at arguably two of Shintaro Keigo's most recognisable and distinctive one-shot comics. A lot of sweets jammed in the head of a girl, and its sequel, Panacotta. The term one-shot comic, by the way, for those who are unaware, comes from the Japanese phrase yomakiri, a term used to describe a comic presented in its entirety without any continuation. A one-shot manga is often written for contests, and sometimes later developed into a full-length series. Not too dissimilar from a television pilot. Shintaro's collection of one-shot comics is where he has garnered most attention, so for the sake of keeping his mini-documentary, well, mini, I will be sticking only to his one-shot comics for this video. I'm also struggling to know where exactly to start with these two comics, as there's no specific A to B plot, nor is there that much dialogue. Instead, we're presented with a fascinating slideshow of watercoloured chaos that only seems to escalate the more pages you turn over. In both books, there is almost 100 pages of over-the-top scenes of depravity, surreal dreamscapes, cannibalism, decapitation, and of course, dark comedy and satire. If there was a way of bringing two absolute extremes and polar opposites together and somehow making them work in perfect unison, Shintaro Keigo's work certainly fits the bill. There are many examples of dismemberment, cracked and split heads and so on, but it's done so completely in jest and dare I say it, almost tastefully with cute and brightly coloured candy, teddy bears, carnival rides and bunny rabbits all exploding from each wound and fracture. There really is nothing else quite like it. Reading through Panacotta, for example, it's clever how it starts off really as kind of cute and surreal, but then after each page, a few more blood splats appear, then a glimpse of bone, then suddenly a view of guts and muscle matter, until finally towards the end, it basically turns into complete mayhem. Graphic scenes of gore and sexual themes everywhere. But then you start to realise, it's really no different from what you've been introduced to at the beginning of a book. The only things that have changed are a few minor details, such as the addition of blood. Replace blood with some gummy bears or something, then poof, problem solved it would seem. But I think that's exactly the point that Keigo is going for here. I find this toying with human psyche absolutely fascinating. It reveals a lot of double standards that seem to crop up in our everyday society, at least from an artist's perspective. I've mentioned it before on this channel that artists often face a very big challenge in life when they're frequently told their art is either too dark or too disturbing to place in the wider world. But the fact is, even if the smallest details are just adjusted or added to the exact same situations, whether it be in society or otherwise, it can make a huge difference to the overall impact. What people generally consider to be acceptable, cute or innocent can very quickly become taboo if it reveals or makes an addition with what is normally brushed swiftly under the carpet. Though in a grand scheme of human nature, sex, blood, parts of a body and internal organs are all absolutely fundamental for us to even physically exist at all. 
The question I suppose isn't whether or not this disturbs you, or whether or not it should be disturbing, but more a question of what your reaction to this imagery says about you, and your outlook on the world. Sometimes it takes splicing the objectively pleasant, and the objectively horrific, perfectly together, to exercise our minds with such thoughts. Okay, now things get really weird. The last manga I want to discuss in this video, by Shintaro Keigo, goes by the name Ultra Power Mongol Invasion. So, how's this for a premise as described by Wikipedia? Quote, For a long time, giants have existed in this world. They were used as tools and played an important role during the turning points in history. The key to the secret lies in Mongolia. End quote. If that's not mad enough for you, how about Genghis Khan and his army riding giant hands that have been cut off of the giants, which also by the way mysteriously grow back, and were used later in history such as during the Crusades? No? Well how about a ship crew who suffer mass seasickness and eventually adopt a new method of communication via vomiting? Well, that's just within the first few chapters, and I can confidently tell you, all of that is tame compared to what else you come across as you read on. This, in my opinion, though I'm yet to see all of Shintaro Kago's works, is by a mile the strangest, funniest, most unhinged, most uncomfortable, most fascinating manga of his that I've read so far, and it's amazing. I'll try my very best to summarise the story. Here goes. Basically, this manga is a historical fantasy story that follows mankind's abuse of an ancient race of giants. The exact origin of these giants I'll explain in a moment. It starts with the Mongol Empire. A tribe is facing battle with Genghis Khan and his army, who ride into battle on big, decapitated hands that overthrow the opposing army with little effort. It's revealed that the Mongols hunt down these cave-dwelling giants and cut off their hands, which mysteriously seem to grow back, kind of like a lizard growing back its discarded tail. The book then refers to these giant hands for the rest of the story as Mongolian horses. These Mongolian horses, from this point onwards, become one of the world's most valuable resources over history. At first, since imported horses from Mongolia cannot be bred without a source, they are used for transport, mostly for the upper class. However, civilizations across Europe begin to discover and capture bigger and stronger variations of quote-unquote horses. I swear to you, this is literally what these giant limbs are referred to all throughout the book. And through very strange and graphic means, they mutilate the horses in various ways to reproduce more horses. From amputations to firing f***ing cannons at them, until the wounds begin to mutilate into horse spawning proliferations. Allowing many kingdoms to finally mass produce this rare resource for people of all classes. Are you all still with me here, by the way? Because it only gets weirder from here. The book continues to take us forward in time, right up to the Industrial Revolution where we're introduced to a young James Watt, who, because he was bullied at school for having a small penis, I think, he develops a sadistic skill in pinpointing physical defects in everything and everyone, which becomes a kind of kink to his fiancée Margaret, which is wholesome, I guess. He also has a rivalry with Richard Arkwright, and replaces Arkwright's hydraulic power with Mongolian horsepower, should we call it? Then, because of this skill, he's also able to rectify the flaws of a horse's, one of which is their short lifespan. He solves this by discovering after a terrible coal mine accident, which makes James Watt so depressed he almost commits suicide by buying a noose from literally a hanging rope shop. But then he says, actually no, I won't kill myself, I'll go back to the coal mine and see what went wrong. He finds that these horses actually have holes in them for feeding and defecating, so I guess mankind was accidentally starving these things all this time. Then they try feeding the horses with various substances, such as wine and vegetable oil and random stuff, to see which one is most effective. And apparently they settle on cow blood. So then a bunch of cow blood factories become a thing, and the entire world becomes basically Mongolian horse-powered. And this chapter ends with James Watt encountering Margaret again. <laughs> 
who gets ugly plastic surgery so that Watt can keep pointing out her flaws for her kicks. And this is so overwhelming for Watt and his defect exposing skills that it gives him a kind of brain damage and it turns him into a vegetable. I'm not making this up, I promise you. Then is later revealed from a homeless scientist put out of work by the popularization of Mongolian horsepower that they originated from an ancient race of giants, whom by this point in history are now considered to be a myth. This is also revealed by a horse that mutates into the body of one of these giants, who the scientist says is a true form of a horse's. And at the beginning of time, the giants were responsible for widening the rift between Earth and Heaven. Or something like that, I don't know to be honest with you. But either way, leading business owners and governing bodies insist on keeping us a secret to the masses, to avoid potentially losing the most valuable energy source. Jumping ahead to World War One, oh oh my god, this is when it gets insane. These Mongolian horses are, of course, still used for warfare. And yes, they're even used to power tanks. F***ing tanks. But not only that, as more horses begin to mutate in unexpected ways, they encounter one that, for some reason, starts sprouting other body parts, such as feet and legs. These then get turned into war machines. Then to defeat those, the opposing nations invent other weird armed and armoured monstrosities. Like, we are truly in the thick of insanity now, people. Just bear with me. We then get introduced to another familiar historical figure, Henry Ford, where we then find out the Mongolian horses are used to power and motorise cars, trams, appliances. Like, imagine a world kind of as you know it today, but everything, including your own TV, is powered by a bunch of giant hands on a hamster wheel somewhere. But because a factory worker accidentally falls into a vat of animal blood produced to feed the horses, a few horses become hostile and aggressive towards other humans and start a bunch of chaos, basically. These become known as the, quote, berserker units. Because of a potential to overthrow enemy forces, as at this point we're in the midst of World War II, the Allied forces decide to once again abuse this discovery and start feeding the units a diet of 100% human blood. These aggressive units are turned basically into fighting war machines, berserker horses are dropped from planes, they make a bloody atomic bomb out of them, and right towards the end of the book, we learn that parts of Mongolian horses are attached to injured and amputee soldiers, basically turning them into the thumb thumbs from Spy Kids. Then, when one of these poor soldiers comes home <laughs> from the war, obviously his wife is horrified, and he accidentally crushes her to death. <laughs> and then, just to top off this heartwarming adventure, knowing he cannot lie with another woman at this point without crushing her, the soldier comes across another horse, falls in love, has intercourse with it, and live happily ever after. And that is literally the story. <laughs> And this is a crazy thing. I still haven't told you all the maddest details within it because A, I don't want to spoil it for you. It's just honestly that entertaining. And B, because there's only so much I can get away with on YouTube. And boy, boy oh boy, it goes without saying that this is not a manga for everyone. But having said that, I still think everyone interested in manga, surreal art or surrealism in general, that this is absolutely worth checking out. I was completely new to Shintaro Keigo until recently, and I was thinking, okay, yeah, his stuff is strange and graphic, but not anything too extreme. But then I read this, and now I know exactly what people mean. Keigo does not hold back. He simply doesn't. He cares very little for the daily logic and reasoning of a reader. He rips you straight out of it, and dumps you right into the deep end of insanity. But aside from this, in all seriousness, I think Shintaro Keigo is truly one of a kind. The whole idea is to toy with your perspectives, and your habitual approaches to things, and turning all that on its head. I am yet to cover other manga artists on this channel in future, but the reason why I wanted to start with Keigo's work is that it shows something that I think is very valuable within art in general, which is that art, in any shape or form, is well and truly limitless. Despite all the backlash, Keigo continues to stick to what he knows he's best at. A style that although makes us shocked, perplexed, or even disgusted, it is nevertheless a style that is uniquely his. And on that point, I think it's important to remember not to take his work too seriously. The main driving force behind his style is satire and dark comedy. Once again, it's not for everyone, 
But if dark humour is your thing, you're in for an amazing ride with Mongol Invasion. I promise you that. I say absolutely give it a read, but at the same time, don't say I didn't warn you. And that concludes my video on Shintaro Keigo for today. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope you found it interesting, or entertaining at least. I'm not going to lie to you, although, like I said, my experience with manga is very on and off compared to the art that I normally talk about, this video was so much fun to make, so I'm definitely planning on getting more manga books, expanding my knowledge, and making a few more videos like this in future. But I'll also need your help, so if you have any mangas you'd like me to cover in future, preferably the weirder and creepier the better, please let me know in the comments below and I'll see what I can do. I also want to give a shout out to the amazing online store that provided me with some source material for this video, phantasmic.com. This is an amazing place to get limited editions of books, mangas, posters, apparel and goodies like that from many dark and underground artists. Please follow the link you see on screen, or hit the link below to have a look around for yourself. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Before I go, it's that time once again for Artist Corner. Here I get to share some artwork sent in by one of my viewers. Today I'd like to share the paintings of an artist who goes by the name of Fiddlewheel. Fiddlewheel is a 35-year-old mixed-media artist from Norway, who has been creating art for most of his life and has studied art at college. However, after suffering a complex mental breakdown when he was a teenager, he was diagnosed with ADHD. His surreal, brightly coloured art over the years has become an outlet for his thoughts and a means to recreate the sense of what it's like to have ADHD. Such as his painting titled That Rampant Mind, which was featured in the Members magazine for ADHD in Norway. The chaotic colours and imagery radiate the sensation of intrusive thoughts, and how one's mind can infest the world around them like a fungi, should they ever let their minds sink into despair. Another painting that explores similar themes would be The King of Dreamland, which this time he explains represents maladaptive daydreaming. Maladaptive daydreaming can make you into a mindless king of your own imagination, he says. The creatures on the sides are meant as psychic leeches, tethering themselves to your brain, while making it into your crown. To indicate his broad range as an artist, aside from his paintings, he also does impressive line art, which he tells me are free play works, where he allows his attention to become truly fluid and unrestrained. I think he's not only technically skilled and talented, but he also has very moving and powerful stories to tell in his art. And I think he really deserves a gander on his Instagram. Please look up the username Fiddlewheel, or please hit the link I left below. If you too are an artist and potentially want to be featured in a future video, I'd love to hear from you. Please send me an email with examples of your work to blinddweller at gmail.com. I'm also on Instagram if you want to see any of my art from time to time. And please be sure to join my Discord server if you want to meet some like-minded artists and get some tips and ideas. Finally, as always, a huge thank you to all my patrons and channel members, and a special shout out to my top tier donators. Harley Simpson, Eric Lamarca, Tyler Rogers, Dave MC, Booty Magic, Molotail, Lee Flowers, Calvin Kai, John Allen, The New On Golem 24, Akaiza, Jose Luis Andonez, Fernando Achicaro, Large Fatty or Big Chad, Charlie Sanchezy, Paul Perea, Ken B, and Carol H. Right, I'm gonna shoot off now. See you in the next one soon. Keep being creative, and bye for now.